Good morning, everyone. So as you are uh, joining us this morning, please feel free to throw in the chat, you know, your name and what college you're from, um, especially if you're from out of California, let us know what part of the country you're from. I don't think we've had anyone from out of the country yet, have we? Um, maybe, maybe today is the day. Um, so I just want to say good morning and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, welcome to today's Friday SLO talk. Um, we are the second to last one of the academic year, so that's very exciting. Uh, my name is Bethany Tasaka. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Um, and I have the pleasure of being joined by the California Assessment Coordinators Hub, or coaches for short, uh, who are also going to help us moderate the discussion. Um, for any of the coaches, folks who are here, could you please introduce yourself? So, yeah. Hi, I am uh, uh, Manda Tainter from Reedley College. I'm faculty coordinator of instructional design and outcomes. So hello from very sunny Central California. Good morning, everyone. My name is Enrique Jauregui. I'm the SLO coordinator for Fresno City College in the Central Valley, and we're a sister to Reedley College. Good morning, Yare Kiano. I'm the founder of the Friday SLO Talks. Pleasure to be here. I want to make sure I don't miss anybody else. Are there any other coaches, folks who are here? Doesn't look Michelle. like Oh, is Michelle here? Oh, hi, Michelle. Please introduce yourself. Michelle. Oh, you're muted, though. Unmute, unmute. There. <laughs> yeah, there we right. go. Okay, there we go. Oh, uh, yes sort of a affiliated, not official coach, but anyways, thank you for having me, Michelle Dunbar at Cal State University, Dominguez Hills in Southern California. Glad to be here, thanks. Happy to have you. Um, again, before we get fully rolling, I'd just like to remind everyone, please introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, and also we use the chat to ask any questions that you have for us today. Um, you can also raise your hand. I, we want this to be a very like, conversational uh, presentation. So if you have questions as we go, um, Throw your hand up, throw it in the chat, and we will do our best to help out as much as we can in the moment. Um, so I'm very excited for today. Our guests today are math faculty from the San Bernardino Community College District. We're in Southern California. I always say we're about an hour inland from Disneyland. That gives people a good idea of where we're at. Um, maybe hour and change. Um, and But I'm also excited because they're my colleagues. So uh, Brandy Bayless is here. She's math faculty at Crafton Hills College, and she is currently rocking it as an interim dean there. Josh Robles is also here. He's also math faculty from Crafton Hills College. Um, and we're, we are missing one. We had Jillian Roberts, who actually got pulled away at the last minute. She was originally scheduled to be here, but she's fantastic, and I'm sure we'll bring her in for something else at another point. Um, as I said earlier, my name is Bethany Tasaka. I am math faculty at San Bernardino Valley College, the sister campus to Crafton Hills, although I did start at Crafton Hills as an adjunct over there, and that's when uh, that's where I met Brandy, and I made her continue talk to, continue to talk to me when I left. <laughs> <laughs> I said she couldn't just ignore me anymore. Um, so I want to say welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for being here and for agreeing to share your expertise. Um, Brandy and Josh, would you like to say any more about who you are and some of your background? No pressure. Uh, I, I've been teaching in the community colleges for a long time. And over that time, my teaching methods have changed because of the good people that I met. Um, I did not have a lot of time to prepare for this presentation, so I want to thank Bethany and Josh and Jillian for all the work they did. My main role here will be agreeing with them and then telling them there's a question in the chat. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. I um, have not been teaching quite as long, and uh, all I will kind of say is um, I've been very curious about doing things a little differently and just trying things also. Um, so Brandy's been a um, cohort of uh, let's let's try some other things and see how they go and that's a lot of what we have to chat about today thank you so uh let's let's kind of get to it i do want to make sure everyone here knows while we are all math faculty today's talk will not just be a giant math lesson don't let josh's background intimidate you um <laughs> there's a good chance there will be some nerdy math jokes in the mix for anyone who does you know appreciate math but we do want to frame everything um uh, for the most part you know in a way that will apply to other disciplines as well because uh, I think our goal today is to really talk about what it means to learn, and sometimes that means learning math um, in this new just educational world that we live in, where students are just 
very different from the ones that we knew four or five years ago. Um, so even if you haven't been teaching for decades and decades, things have changed a lot in recent years. So I would guess that most of you, if not all of you, share a lot of the similar experiences we're having, um, regardless of your discipline or your specific area. And I would also guess that all of you care very deeply about the success of your students um, and you want them to not just pass your course, but to learn the material, to appreciate the material um, in an authentic way. So let me read the summary of today's talk and then we can kind of jump into it. So our summary is, in the age of AI, artificial intelligence, and AB 1705, teaching and learning are changing rapidly, and math is no exception. Join us as we talk about adapting to this new reality. We'll explore how AI impacts student learning and include teaching stories and strategies from California Community College math faculty, and we'll discuss the importance of focusing on student learning over test performance um, and teaching responsible AI use. We'll, both, uh, we'll share both successes and failures, because those are just as common, right, um, relating to academic integrity, student-centered classrooms, and learning in the age of AI and AB 1705. So we want to talk about how to empower students to take ownership of their learning and to use technology to their advantage. So join us as we engage uh, in a discussion and emphasis on the engagement as you please join us um, as we talk about how to navigate challenges and opportunities of learning math with today's students. So that being said, let me share. There's our very long title. <laughs> Again, not just for math faculty, but we do appreciate anyone in the room who is math faculty. Um, so we want to just start off with, uh, we kind of did some introductions, but maybe we could share a little bit about, um, you know, our, our courses that we teach frequently. So I can kind of start us off. Um, I, I think the courses that I find myself teaching the most often um, are plain trigonometry, uh, pre-calculus, and calculus. Uh, calculus 1, I do have a little bit of like college algebra sprinkled in there from time to time, um, but I do find myself there. I also want to mention that um, because of other roles I have, I'm curriculum chair at my campus, I have a lot of reassigned time, so I actually do not teach as much as I used to teach, um, and I do think that has allowed me some flexibility to experiment with my classroom environment, so I kind of just want to put that out there as well. Um, Brandy or Josh, do you want to share some of the courses that you teach, maybe, you know, any any other introductory information? Uh, sure. So mine is kind of similar. I have a little bit of reassigned time um, for the guided pathways efforts at our campus. And so um, some of that has leaked into the classroom too. And so um, the last few years I was focusing mainly in stats. Um, and that's where most of this, um, you know, what we're going to mention I've done in, but um, I also do teach a handful of the calculus courses and some of those I've tried there. Um, yeah, that's uh, I usually focus on statistics um, with a little bit of calculus. Um, I did want to say that as I moved into teaching, most of my changes went into our statistics courses, and there was a lot of pushback to make those changes happen. So part of the reason that we want these conversations, and that it's so important, there's so many other faculty in the room besides math faculty, is to make sure that we're being supported as we try and make positive changes for our students. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So I'm sure many of you know, uh, well, most of you in California know, right? Maybe not everyone who's outside of California. Recently, we've experienced a lot of change um, for math and actually for our English classrooms as well. Um, we had something called AB705 come in just in time for COVID, which was really fun, um, and then followed up with AB1705. Um, do either of you want to give kind of a summary of that? Um, I'll take AB 705 if Josh oh, sure. can move to 1705. Sure. I know you've recently done some research on it. Um, AB 705 really moved us away from our prerequisite courses. So we used to have a very long chain of courses before you could get to a um, upper division math course. When I was a student at the community colleges, I had to start in math 942, which was basic arithmetic. So for me to be able to get to a transfer level class, I had to take 942, 952, 090, and 095 before I could get to a 100 level math course. And AB 705 um, legislated changes to make sure that that wouldn't happen to students in the future. Um, so 1705 was similar, it added on to that. So it, um, it, it does 
uh, they both work in two ways. They work with the placement and how students place. So they use uh, what they call multiple measures. Um, so much less of the um, assessments, well, essentially no assessments anymore. And something like previous coursework, high school GPA are, are better indicators of how you'll, how you'll do in, in math and, and uh, English classes also. Um, 1705 kind of strengthens all of that. Um, as you can imagine, uh, lots of math faculty, um, I've seen less pushback in, in the English departments, um, but less math fac uh, faculty weren't really okay with some of those changes. And so I think 1705 was meant to um, push everyone a little further and highlight a little more, um, for example, for us, what relates to us, like the pathways to calculus. And so clarifying um, 1705 kind of highlights the pathway to college algebra. Um, usually that first kind of transfer college level course. And 1705 is trying to clarify pathways to calculus for STEM and, and more uh, clarify more um, like non-credit aspect and the um, kind of transfer level for non-STEM also. I, I will say as like an anecdote, um, me and my wife were uh, in community college and we had a kind of failed experience at um, challenging level schools and we were returning to school and we both ended up, um, this was before 705 was implemented. Uh, we both ended up at a school that was much more flexible with their assessment process. Uh, we had both done like calculus and pre-cal, but maybe not so great at them. And one of our local schools wanted us to um, do the assessment and said we, we needed to be in like intermediate algebra. And one of the other schools took a little bit more holistic look at our uh, transcripts and said, sure, you can start in like Calc 2 or something. And that was the huge disparity. Um, so I also had a similar example. Thankfully, I was able to find a school that supported that better. We both did. Well, and I think that speaks to challenges we're facing now is we have these students who come to us with very different preparation levels and um, our colleges are not all handling it the same, right? So some people are like, yes, AB 1705, seven, like, let's change, let's do this right away. And then other colleges, I know mine was was like that for a really long time. It was almost like denial. <laughs> like, th this is going to go away. We just have to wait it out. And we're like, no, this is the law. We have to do this. This is not going anywhere. But it really changed um, the some of the preparedness levels of our students. And I think in some ways, um, it affected student confidence. So a lot of the data shows that the students still can be very successful taking, you know, not doing all that sequence like Brandy had to do and being able to take a college level class. But sometimes when you tell students you're ready for a college level class, they go, oh my God, are you sure? Should I be in that? And so even that has been um, a piece of it, right? So there's there's this like, um, I guess, confidence in, in understanding that they do belong in those classes and that will help them get through the class to get there. Um, one of the other really big challenges that we faced is artificial intelligence, and I know that that is no, uh, you know, we're no stranger to that. I, we talked about that, I think, last week, and it's been a topic several times in these coaches' meetings of how artificial intel intelligence affects how we teach. Um, I know for me, one of the first times I became very aware of it was, it was a semester right before everything shut down, so it'd be what, like fall 19? Um, and I had a student sitting on his phone and I'm like, oh, what are you doing? Are you just using your calculator or something? No, <laughs> looking up how to do the whole question. And I was like, what is this? What are you doing? Um, and so I, I wanted to just share, uh, I just Googled, let's see how well this, I just Googled math help, um, excuse my 30 different tabs that I always have, but if you just Google math help, I didn't even get specific about the course. There's all these different, you know, some are sponsored, but there's all these different ways that students can get very, very, um, I don't know, answer driven help. Um, and so this is another thing we're seeing in a lot of our classrooms, right? What is the website that solves math problems? <laughs> you know, there's all these really interesting things. Um, and I was just gonna click on one of the first ones. Um, and this is this is what we are kind of are we're seeing you know so enter a problem do either of you have a good problem we could we could go through I didn't pick one ahead of time but it it does various levels um, of math no do um do integration um where's that I see I don't know how to use all this 
very well. F X. There we go. Nope, it's not there. Okay, I gave you something way too hard. You Don't did. It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think you can tell it, right? Integrate. I don't know. We'll we'll try x squared. And it walks you through it and it gives you uh, you know, and, and that was just with words. I don't know, you know, we have the ability to type it all, but it gives you links to where it comes from, it gives you links to like what it's talking about. Um, and so we've run into a lot of, you know, like it it's less about getting the work done. And a lot of it has shifted to just getting answers, right? I know that that's what I experienced a lot. I don't know about you two. Um, let me go back to my thing over here. So those are some of the things that we're kind of facing in our classrooms. Yeah, photo math is a huge one. Um, you can literally take a picture of math um, and get the whole thing worked out for you. Yeah, and I didn't pick a very complicated problem, but um, yeah, so so how do we deal with all this has <laughs> been the question facing math faculty for all these years. So we have, um, you know, just different preparation levels. We have different confidence levels and we have these answers that are at our fingertips. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like our equivalent of chat GPT. Um, so one thing we really just want to talk about, and, and again, we want to make it conversational as much as we can is, how did that affect your instruction? How did that affect what you do in the classroom? Um, I think Josh, you're up. I don't know how much you want to frame it and I'll, I'll tell me when to hit the slide and I'll move forward. Um, so I will clarify that like I, I remember using this as a student. Um, these were the, 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 I would say like the gen ones that were a little harder to use, but still very available. Um, and now that we're really in like the gen two, I'm making up these generations, but we're really in the gen two of, um, they're very easy to use. So, you know, in the chat, people are mentioning photo math. That's the one you take the picture. Um, Mathway, Symbol Lab are the ones you can type in or, or usually give it something. Um, but I remember, you know, as soon as like, I knew I used it as a student, I was just like, well, I actually learned from it. And so I wanted to actually show students how to use that. Um, in that aspect and so kind of early on you know, I, mean, I haven't you know been teaching all that long but i kind of always were trying to integrate it slowly because i knew its usefulness if i could figure out how to not just get them to like get through the homework with them um you can, you can go to the next slide um so uh we're starting with just some examples here um and so uh, later on, we'll kind of highlight like the, the theme, but um, so in that vein of, I, I don't need students to focus so much on finding the right answer. Um, in math disciplines, we also frequently use the online homework help systems, online homework systems, which often have a lot of help features. And so that does allow students to frequently uh, figure out how to do it by clicking through it and um, Kind of brute force eventually they'll get it done and so with kind of all of those things happening um uh and bethany has something similar later too we tra I transition to having students just kind of tell me did they learn it um some of this is that on grading movement also and so this is my current um kind of early iteration of students uh they they tell me based on the topic that we're talking about what level of competency they think they're at. And they give themselves the points accordingly. Um, and this is uh, what they attach to the top of their paper or math homework that they turn in. Um, and so um, I've noticed that students, um, you know, really engage that kind of metacognition a little more here and engage with themselves and the material more. Um, and they're not even, they're, they're pretty harsh on themselves too. And so um, that gives us a place to discuss and, and comment, you know, how they're feeling about it more and how to support them more. Um, I think I have a, a student example next. And so um, this was uh, my current stack of papers. This was just turned in yesterday. <laughs> um, and so uh, these are in a calculus one class. Uh, we're um, finishing up some application problems. So you can see that left-hand column, learning objectives, 
uh, related rates and um, approximations. So these are the end of the semester calculus one topics. Um, and most of the time the students, you know, do give me some interesting comments um, and they're kind of reflective about it. Um, this is not the best, but it's also not the worst example. The worst examples are no comments. And um, I don't always feel like forcing them. They might not have much to say. Um, and so uh, I tell them that like, this is what I'm actually looking for most. I'll peruse what your written work says. Uh, what are you thinking about it? And uh, I just like the, um, I, I, especially that like first one, it was hard. And then I uh, worked on it and I got some help. And then usually they say, I kind of started doing better. Um, forgot what's next. Oh, and um, my other big change um, in, and so those are what you saw earlier was homework assignments. Uh, again, I wanted to engage students a little more directly. And so the other thing I've done is to allow them, this is more of that on grading movement, is allow them um, some chance to, to assess themselves. And so um, this is a portion of an exam. I give them an outline of what should have been done. This is a in a Calc 1 class. These were, this is where this examples are coming from. And I make a rubric for them. Um, this one's, you know, that they've, they've seen that homework rubric and that's where it was uh, kind of modified from. And uh, again, these are pretty early in, in my practice. Um, so I don't think they, uh, they're kind of finalized yet. And students um, grade themselves. So like the next day after the exam, um, they'll work in pairs. They'll grade themselves and then they need a, a witness to uh, verify their grading. And um, I just take them at their word. All I do check, especially the first time we do this, is that they had some problem down, they had something there. Um, and so I try not to read it too carefully. Uh, I just trust them. Um, but I, you know, I had one student who said, Well, you said give us how we feel. I feel I did great. And I was like, but there was like almost nothing written down. That was the one student I had to chat with, but that also brings opportunities to chat with them. Um, and so at the moment, it's, it's um, kind of working as intended. I don't have one filled out. They get it back. They, they, they keep these. So I never haven't thought to uh, capture their, their evidence and their, their signatures and stuff. I think those are my set of examples. Nope, I have one more. I can so many examples here. Um, those are examples from calculuses. Uh, like I said, my experience is kind of like Brandy's are stats and calculus. Um, this is something instead from my statistics class. So my statistics class, I happen to have been doing um, not different uh, assessments directly, but kind of the whole course structure. And so I've been using, uh, still back to those different on grading methods, um, the like standards mastery grading idea. And um, all I wanted to highlight here is that students fill out a contract. And so they say, uh, so they read the syllabus on their own and say, this is what I need to do to earn a grade. And if you're familiar with that master grading idea uh, or specifications or standards, I'm not super familiar with what the differences all are, um, uh, contract grading also, is that they're going through and it's more of a checkbox system is how I've interpreted that. And so they have a few things to run through, a few percentages to maintain. Um, but mainly that I'm holding them to this contract that they did agree. Um, and so in like, for me, the, the similar thing in all of this was allowing students to kind of make the choice. What do they want to work for? In the other class, it's kind of actually make the choice by grading them some of themselves and, and seeing their work after the fact. I finally think that's all of the, the, my examples. That's okay. Yeah, so it's it's interesting because even across different courses, you know, the the way we approach it is different. And some of that is because the content is very different. You know, what's taught in a stats class is very different than what's taught in a calc class. But some of it is also, I think, student maturity is a piece of it. Um, for a lot of us, Calc 2 is kind of that second year class, or it's kind of designed to be a second year class. Um, and so students are um they're just a little more mature, right? They've maybe taken some other courses as well, and um, they maybe view their education a little bit differently. You also did get um, maybe more STEM-oriented students, so they might approach the classes not so much as one they just have to get through, but they might see different value in it because they know they need it for, you know, whatever their major might be afterwards. Um, I do want to give Brandy a chance 
to respond to a question in the chat about um, photo math. And you, you mentioned it's been a really useful resource to you. Um, do you want to talk about that more? Uh, yeah. So AI in general, I have found to be very useful. I'm a huge proponent of using it as much as possible. Um, for photo math, we would be able to use it in class. So if a student had a question on a homework, right, and they didn't bring in all their work because they can't always be responsible for remembering everything, that means that, and especially in the Calc 2 class, I am trying to work through a gigantic problem because they had a question at the end. What photo math would allow us to do is write down the problem. There was always a student in the class that had photo math, and then we could skip to the parts where the student had a question without me having to work through the whole problem. Um, when students would work through problems and get stuck, they'd be able to use photo math to say, oh, I dropped a parenthesis, right? And that you're, you're relieving so much of their stress, right? And their anxiety and their negative self-talk from just being able to allow them to take a picture and go, oh, I dropped a parenthesis. It's not that I don't understand math. It's not that I have no idea what I'm doing. I just made a small mistake and now I can fix it without all of that stress and negative self-talk until I can go talk to my instructor or talk to a tutor you've relieved a lot of that and that's worth so much to them. Um, I think we just need to assess how we are getting answers from our students. As Bethany said, photo math is extremely answer-based, but that is also one of its strengths is that students can start identifying why that answer was good because they have a hard time with so much of their work being online, getting that down on paper. But when they have a constant example of, I could figure out where I made my mistake because I did my work well and photo math did its work well. And then they can start making those connections to what does good work look like and how do we interpret it? And why is it so important to have clear documentation? Uh, Robert, you have a question? Maybe, <laughs> can you unmute? Uh, maybe I have to ask you to unmute. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, I guess my, my whole, kind of concern is is we are now having to help students develop a very like emergent skill of how to use AI technology appropriately, right? I think that's the piece that I'm I'm really concerned about because I I don't even know. I don't think many faculty, right, have a good understanding of like what are the capacities, what are the limitations, what are, you know, um, and now we're also having to inform students on how to use this appropriately to like to support learning. Um, I think, you know, I, I'm very supportive of that end goal. I'm just really struggling with like how to get there and how to support faculty in getting there. So I would say that you're doing all the right things because you're here having the conversations, right? Um, it's a learning experience for all of us, but we can get there together by bouncing these ideas off of each other. And one of the best ways to integrate things well into the classroom is to do it conversationally with your students. So open up the floodgates so you can use it wherever, whenever you want, and then really get that feedback from your students. Do you feel like this helped you learn? Why did it help you learn? Do you feel like now that you've got and done it this way, you'd be able to do it on an assessment? And if not, then let's try and figure out were we using the tool correctly or not. Um, just having those conversations with your students. Since I discovered ChatGBT, there has not been a single day that I have not used it. <laughs> it is a miracle um, solution for so many of our communication problems that we have, especially in online learning, to be able to make sure that our communication was as clear as possible for our students and relieve, again, so much of their stress and the back and forth. Um, from my perspective, I am an answer person. I want to tell the student the answer to the problem. You know, So when I get the email that's this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened, and I'm really stressed out, can I have an extension? I would respond with, yes, you have an extension. And what I would miss in that communication is that I did not validate um, any of the things that they shared with me, right? I just gave them a solution to their problem. And using something like ChatGPT to, to throw it in and say, respond to the student and see how it would and see that the artificial intelligence was good enough to remind me that I needed to validate their experience and also offer them a solution, it makes a really big difference. Um, so I would say, use it as much as possible, feel out how you're using it and really pivot on the conversations. And I, if I could throw in there too, I think that there's a lot of value in just trying it. Um, I think that it's not something that's just going to go away tomorrow. Like all of this, all these apps, all these sites, like Josh mentioned, they've been around for a while. They are also not going away and they're getting better. 
So I, I kind of parallel it to calculator usage, right? I remember being a kid in school and it's like, we well, have to learn how to do that. You're not going to carry a calculator around with you every day. We all literally have calculators on our phones and we literally carry calculators around every day, right? So there are some things like, yes, there's value in knowing, you know, how to multiply something the long way. Do I have to do it every single day? No, right? There's so, so it's teaching people how to use it correctly and giving them those boundaries with it. So like, okay, you tried it, but you have no idea what you wrote down when you tried it. So if you can't also explain it back to me, we need to backtrack a little bit and we need to go over this question again, or we need to talk about it a little bit more, or let's look at the answer you wrote and pick out the things that don't make sense so we can talk about it. It's, I think it has to be that conversation. Um, I, I think if it's just left alone, it could go very badly, but like Brandy said, talk to them about it. Um, you know, did you understand the answer that they wrote down? Sometimes AI puts out weird answers, especially when you're solving logarithms for whatever reason. That is always my first clue of like, oh, they use photo, they use photo math for this weird logarithm answers. And, and, you know, when you talk to them and go like, Hey, this doesn't make a lot of sense. Let's, let's talk about why it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I, it goes a long way. Um, Josh, I don't know if you had anything. I saw you unmute earlier. Um, yeah, so so Brandy mentioned like you know using it and um, kind of acknowledging the students and um, I will say so you can see with the, the stuff I mentioned I kind of I've been turning more of the responsibility to the students themselves and I'm also been doing that as a classroom uh, to to the class as a whole so like you know the reason that we try and do some you know group work in class is so that you have more people to rely on than just me. Um, it's it's me, of course, and it's your classmates, and it's the software, and it's everything. There, we're all here to kind of help you get through this. And so, um, I just try and start small and and just integrate it into our day to day. Um, that was one reason I switched to a textbook that had a, a really good website version. So an OER textbook that had a website so that I could say something like in class of pull up the, the text and find a problem and then um, you know, use uh, a photo math or whatever uh, to check your work along the way. So that'll be part of the day's assignment, like check your work here. And, and I try and really make that specific of, you know, the, the book has an answer, final answer, but this was a large multi-step problem like where can you use the tools to, to help you and how will they not help you? Um, if it's too difficult, um, I've actually, I haven't even used chat GPT yet. I'm still using my, uh, my old gen one stuff, but um, you know, where, wh where can it easily check your work? Um, you know, is it, is it something just simple? Like, a, is it just really a calculator? Is it just calculating for you or is it doing actually advanced stuff? And, where along the process can you as a student check your work? Like, when do you know if you have something that's checkable? And that'll be kind of that question of the day's, you know, worksheet or whatever. And, and then that'll be given, you know, then students will be working on that. And then hopefully organically those discussions might be happening. And so one student will pull out a photo math, but then they're like, well, that doesn't look right. And so they can have those on their own. I can come by and reinforce those. Cause I mean, I actually, I would prefer them to, to, to be um, interested enough in, in at least succeeding that they want to know those answers. But I do still have students who are not that interested in picking that up, that they don't want to put in that effort still. And so I try and at least optimistically say, hey, maybe you were trying to use the software and that's all that I see, right? Maybe you see a weird logarithm answer at Bethany, but but maybe they did try it on their own. They didn't figure it out. So they went to that and then that's their final answer. I try and wrap that up with, hey, at least you really wanted to get the answer right. Um, sometimes like I, I, I can't get that to happen. And so here are all these ways to kind of reinforce that. Yeah, and I'm seeing Martin's comment in the chat. You know, it's, it's how to... Um... Cause I like, I'll use it too, Robert. I'll use it for, you know, like, oh God, I, <laughs> I need, I just need the solution to this really fast. Right. And I'll type it in kind of like Brandy was saying earlier, you know, how do we figure this out? And, and it is really useful for me as well, but it, you're right. We, we have students who are 
learning a lot of this material, some of them for the very first time, some of them not. And there, there is a balance that we have to figure out. And I also think there's student responsibility in figuring that out. And I think we have to be honest with our students of like, look, you have all these tools at your disposal. How are you going to work with it? it? To me, it's very similar to, um, you know, I think about my my computer science friends and, you know, they have to teach their students to be ethical as well. You know, hey, you have all these skills you're learning. Here's why hacking is maybe not the best thing. Maybe you shouldn't be doing that or, um, you know, even thinking like our, our, you know, our English friends and, you know, teaching students about how to, you know, maybe use ChatGP as a jumping off point, but not necessarily, um, you know, it should not be your entire paper, your entire thought process for you. Um, but, you know, for me, at least uh, for, for Robert and for uh, Martin, who are, you know, kind of asking, I was also very reluctant. Um, and I guess this kind of segues into my bit a little bit, but I was also very, very reluctant. And I think my initial reaction was like, shut it down. Absolutely not. We're not doing this. Like how many different ways can I like not let students do this? You know what I mean? Because I was more focused on a cheating aspect than I was on the learning aspect. And I had to, I don't know, unlearn. I feel like I'm going to say that a few times today, but I had to unlearn a lot about like, no, it's okay because I remember as a student, like I, I looked up solutions. I didn't necessarily look it up on um, online, but we'd find solution manuals for our textbooks or I'd, I'd talk to my colleagues and like, hey, or my classmates, like, hey, how did you solve this one? How did you get, how did you do this? You know, and it's, it's not dramatically different in the grand scheme of things, right? And how we're getting to our answers. It's, um, but it's, I don't know, it's just being honest of like, it's out there. We're, we're not gonna be able to take this back. We're not gonna be put it, you know, be able to put it away. Um, and so for me, when all of you know, COVID and all these things hit, I think I got very rigid and I regret that. I really wish that I didn't. I wish that I was more understanding in those early days because things were really hard. Um, you know, and I, I, I did use things like, uh, Proctorio and it was very, I don't know, I was, I was more rigid, um, than I should have been. And I had to kind of check myself at some point. I probably was talking to Brandy about what she was doing during COVID and I'd check myself and just go, this is, this is not learning anymore. This is not classroom anymore. This is so, um, it's so strict and it's so hyper-focused on what could go wrong that I'm not focused anymore on the love of the concept or, you know, like, Hey, this is, this is fun. This is a nerdy thing for me to say, but I enjoy taking these derivatives or I really, isn't this the coolest thing that you can integrate and find the area? And they're like, it's absolutely not fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but getting excited over those things started to kind of diminish because that wasn't my focus anymore. Um, so I, I had to really pause and there was one semester where I took a pretty dramatic shift and I was just like, all right, we're just going to try other things and we're going to see where they're going to go. Um, so uh, I don't, I want to be conscious of some of the questions. I see Josh and Brandy responding. Any questions we need to look at from the Oh, we're getting to a few, but uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> we can talk about them too. I don't. I can. I can pause my stuff because um, I know um, that cheating is a big thing. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah. So some of the the comment uh, questions are a little different. Um, uh, yeah, I I'm back on uh, Jung Ha's question of like the, the 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 lower level student raising them up versus the upper level student letting them excel. Um, and I uh, so so one thing I put in the chat there is. Um, again, I've been pushing more work on the students and saying, you do something interesting. Like, and it's worked out pretty well. And for example, in, in this scenario, um, the, you, you're seeing it now, it's what you've it's been uh, screen sharing for a while. There's, there's just a very blank line of uh, complete blank extensions. I give a very minimal prompt and say, you do something that relates to our class and extend it. And um, like uh, a passing C student doesn't need to do that at all. And an A student needs to do a few of them. Um, and then they kind of get in, as involved as they want. Um, and it's just as it's going to work out most of the time that the students going for an A are going to push themselves pretty hard anyways. And so I just kind of say, make it related to our class. I do give them some examples, but the whole semester I kind of highlight, oh, maybe you want to do this. Maybe here's somewhere to do this. Uh, like read, this is for stats, read a really in-depth research article and then tell us how it relates to our class. 
uh, find this really interesting large data set and, and tell us uh, and then figure it out on your own. And sometimes you say, learn some software, like, you know, YouTube it, figure it out. And um, so students learn um, some advanced visualization or stats softwares on their own, and they then they show us how they did it. So I just put it in there, and then I, I purposely not, I don't put it in for students who just need to pass or are you know at that point are only looking to pass. And and I see Robert's uh, most recent comment in the chat. I I'm experiencing that at my institution where. Um, there's a lot of people who are still just trying to pretend like it's not happening and that's harmful to our students when we um you know we're in many ways we're closing the door on learning opportunities from them right and i think we need to be really conscious of that um josh do you see a, the comment about sharing a syllabus in there i don't know if you have one handy <laughs> i can stop sharing if you want to share it um we also have the great oh. contract coming up in a couple slides oh yeah we do have a grading contract coming up thanks um, Enrique, go ahead. Oh, thank you, uh, Bethany. Um, Josh, I think you you spoke to that. You know, having the uh, still in uh, still in A, having it, you know, with the C, then still in B, having all A's. How do you move the spectrum uh, as far as do you want to move that still in A? Make sure that they have a you know score of B's and A's. Or are you more focused on learning? Make sure that the student who is getting a C, uh, that you know that he's learning what he's supposed to be learning, because that student who has an A already, like Bethany said, he's going to push himself, you know, you know, to get that A. But my question will be then: How do you then focus for student those students who have C, maybe a low C or whatever? Um, so the, the, the focusing aspect is something that I did, uh, work a lot on. Let me go ahead and pull up my syllabus. Um, this is for stats. Well, while you do that, I'll address Tracy's comment in the chat. I think that is a really important point. I don't think that our students enter our classes you know, planning how they're going to cheat their way through it. But I think reality is um, our semesters are 16 weeks and finals week long. So it's 17 weeks. It's a long semester. I know right now my students are exhausted um, and it's hard for them to, um, that endurance piece can be really hard sometimes. Um, and so I think, you know, to Tracy's point, it, it is sometimes easier, you know, to, default to, oh, let me just look it up or let me look how to do it. And it, I mean, if you teach them kind of boundaries of like, this is this is an okay use versus this might be crossing a line, you know, turning in someone, I think that's healthier for them in the long run um, because they're definitely going to get tired over the course of the semester. Uh, go ahead, Josh. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think I can kind of address, um, sorry, I forgot whose question that was. Oh, Enrique. Um, so, uh, you know, I, and this is not like, perfect or anything, but I tried to scaffold it so that a student can move up. Um, but but students will be pretty honest early. So so they sign that contract early, you know, week, maybe not like day one, but maybe week two, you've seen the class, what do you think you're shooting for? And then I go with that and yeah, I will tell them, well, here's what you need to do if you wanted to move one up. Um, or, you know, I, I'm worried you're not progressing. I try and keep some stats on how, how are they progressing along the way. This class is a scenario where, um, the the uh, encourages um, has the mastery grading aspect and so I give a handful of quizzes instead of exams but students can complete them on their own time that complicates things else because sometimes I don't really know where a student's at because they might not be attempting it and I have to encourage them to attempt stuff but um so I, I tried to work on this is something I, I have in the notes later highlighting what is most important from the course I'd like you to focus there. And then if that's going well, here's how you can, you know, continue that. Um, so this is the specific grading aspect of the syllabus. And so a student who is, you know, going for a C, that's maybe what they say initially. That is, I usually don't get that a lot though. The grade contracts are A's and B's. Uh, probably um, in, in a stats class where most people think about as a GE course, more B's than A's. Um, and then they they reevaluate it later and then they do an upgraded contract and then they do a little where they're at, how much they've done, um, how much more they have to do. 
on like a timeline to complete those. And those, um, that's when we say, oh, I just need to shoot for a C now. Um, and then they still say, but I'm gonna try for the B still, but I'm gonna fill out the C contract just in case. Um, again, just letting them decide. Um, they're usually pretty honest. And then I can say like, I, I don't, you know, if stats is not your thing and, and you're, we understand that I, I don't have to you know, encourage everyone to, to worry about that. Um, I think that's fine sometimes too. And so, you know, this is a little bit complicated on how much you wanna explain what's happening here, but um, this is their kind of matrix of what they need to do based on each grade. And uh, we try and go over it enough that and they fill out that contract so that they're pretty sure about it. Um, I mm -hmm. think that I do have this link for my syllabus in the slides overall, so somewhere. Yeah, I think a lot of us have um, some links to documents in the in the bottom, um, in the notes of the presentation. Yeah, I'm not on this level yet. <laughs> when I grow up, I'll be Brandy or Josh, maybe. <laughs> I do want to say that the Josh and I have offices that you know are like a door apart, so uh, we have had uh, the opportunity, and we have really pivoted on it to push each other as much as possible by running down the hallway and going, look what I just did. I deleted all of this. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> um, it's been not just rewarding for our students, but it's been a really fun experience too, to shed ourselves of so much of that stress that comes with, I feel like I have to assess all the time and really moving into the position of now I, I feel like I'm supporting students instead of grading students. Um, it's, it takes a lot of the stress out of the classroom for yourself as well. I did want to say for the grading contracts, I took what we have coming up on the, I think the next slide, and I, I restacked them into a contract for each grade, and I gave every student every contract. Um, and I was in Calc 2, I had far more students choose a C. Um, that's a particularly intimidating class. If you're familiar with math, Calc 2 is just one of those classes where we, we curriculum throws everything in there. Um, so this was what was represented on the syllabus. They also had a link to it on my website. <clears throat> and I took what you're seeing here for approaching the letter grades and I made them into their own contracts, but I made sure that every student got every letter grade, regardless of which one they were going for. And then towards the end of the semester, we checked in and we went through um, and saw how many boxes were checked and how close they were to their letter grade. And for many students, it was at that point, two weeks before the semester, because we had no due dates, that they realized they could do better, right? For my A students, they were doing an A all along so they could push themselves out. Um, and this is speaking to that differentiated instruction. They could do things that weren't in this assessment because they had been pushing themselves all semester. For my C students, they realized that they had completed a C and they still had two weeks to go. So a lot of them went from a C to a B. Some of them went from a C to an A. I had the highest grades I have ever had in my teaching experience in that course because once they realized that they had done everything necessary and they still had time, they, they moved themselves forward on their own. I had very similar experiencing experiences with uh, this mastery style system in a stats class. Um, some students came in at the end who in, in a normal situation would not have passed for sure because they had a little too much to make up, but they were all close. Right, you can not understand a lot of topics, but like be very close on them. And so they actually didn't have a lot to, to really to fix. They came in during the last time and the end of the semester to work on those and ended at B's. And again, I'm, I'm positive that those students unfortunately would not have passed normally. Um, and, and, and just interesting to their mindset too. Um, you know, so um, for both Brandy and I, this mastery quizzes, they're, they're small quizzes that they essentially need to pass at near 100%. That's what makes you, that's what we say you mastered it. And um, so they, you know, it's sometimes it's the last day of finals, they're attempting their last one and they're turning it in. Um, no one's ever too happy to take a stats final, in my experience. And they're handing it in and they're relatively excited saying, thanks for the class, kind of. I don't need to get that a lot um, in stats. And uh, and they know they're getting a B and they're saying, you know, and they're just, they, they know their grade right then because they know they got them right. And they're turning it in and, and just that relief and, and, and that I was excited for them too. Um, and that was the only time that's ever happened when, when I was working something like this. So Andrea is here. Andrea is a counselor at my college and she's awesome. And she had her hand up. 
Hi, Andrea. Oh, I think I have to ask you to unmute. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. Hi. Yes. You're, thank you, Bethany. You're wonderful. And <laughs> hi, everyone. Um, just a question for you, Brandy and Josh. Um, you said the students were able to move up, and I may have missed this. So do you let them redo homework or redo the, the quizzes? Is that how they moved up in grades or I'm just? Yes, so they can take the quizzes repeatedly um, okay. to help them move up. And they also can continue working on homework. And, and for the students who were between grades and hadn't quite made the homework uh, percentage, we would let that go, right? It was more important that they had assessed and learned the mastery than that they had really met that 80%. So if they're sitting at 76, I would tell them just focus on the quizzes and we'll, we'll call 76 close enough. Um, and then there was no due dates in the class. So they could work on it all semester. Yeah, uh, like we, we kind of co-made co the system. So very similar scenarios. Um, I think I framed um, what's here is the, the minimum to guarantee the grade. There could be some flexibility um, and I, I clarify to students the importance of like which what am I looking for most and you know it is that still kind of the, the quizzes are they're still standard examinations in a way um and, and yeah that was a little bit hectic there they're working on it at the end and so I was curious I, I asked the students in a small survey um somewhat anonymously that they did they um did that was that like more stressful for them did it like encourage the procrastination on their part? Um, and they said, no, it was fine. They didn't mind the idea of being able to kind of do, do it all right at the end or kind of upgrade the grades right at the end. Um, it was scary for me. It's not usually normally I'm able to track their grades and I keep track and tell them, find, find issues. Sometimes I didn't know much until the end, but um, they seemed okay with it. I didn't have any real complaints. <laughs> Um, I was going to speak to what Josh just said. I had the very similar situation where halfway through the semester, all of my students were failing and I was having a mental breakdown. <laughs> um, so I was in Josh's office. We have a committee on our campus called the BESPA. I don't remember what it stands for, but essentially like equity and teaching committee. And so I went to them um, with my syllabus and all the assignments and what I was doing and told them what my outcomes were for the class and how students were doing. And they sat with me and said, you know, if they're not finishing their homework on time, try starting it in the classroom. And they just went, went through it and read it, gave me feedback on what I was doing and helped me make changes to my classroom to help move the students forward at a quicker pace because I was terrified that they were going to come to me the last week of the semester trying to turn everything in at once and they would be overwhelmed and I would be overwhelmed. Um, so being able to have those conversations and really get on it when we see that our students are uh, receptive to our methods helps. It really helps to have those faculty on your campus that are willing to think outside the box with you. So Jeannie asked in the chat, how do you handle grading or quizzes and tests only graded using online systems, or are you reviewing written work as well? In, in this case, uh, we were reviewing written, uh, written work, um, but everything was graded kind of on a binary system because they have to, they have to get a, a, a good enough, you know, sometimes a small math mistake, you know, it, it doesn't mean you don't know it. So that's very small differences, but essentially the student has to complete that problem. And these still are relatively short that the student in general, like the amount of questions assessed, individual questions would be less in this system, I think, than a traditional exam, but you're requiring that they do very well on it, whether you're, whether you're specifically at 100% or not. Um, and so I, uh, you know, we were grading both of these just pretty binarily, like you got it zero, are we, are you not the other way, right? Um, you got it one point, you didn't zero. There's five or seven questions on this quiz. You need five or seven to pass. So it was reasonable. It, yeah, it, uh, it wasn't great. But, but in general, it kind of spread the grading out throughout the semester a little more, besides right at the end. Um, so the uh, students were taking them throughout, retaking uh, a little bit and so I never had huge amounts like I would normally do in exam periods except for right at the end of the semester. For me these were all um, uh, in-person courses. Um, I wanted to be able to respond to Jung Ha's question in the chat and Jeannie's question in the chat. So first uh, she Jung Ha am I saying it right I'm sorry okay 
Um, mathematical content usually is built with previous materials. So what saved us from students not trying to leapfrog incorrectly um, was that the homework is self-graded and self-assessed so they can move through that and really play with what's missing um, and build it in themselves. The second part was that there was no due dates. So I didn't, students didn't feel pressure to try and pass like integration by parts before they had figured out substitution. So they could go as they wanted and move forward through it. So that really helped address the, the sort of scaffolding that is built into um, a science or mathematics. I am seeing a lot of feedback on asynchronous learning. And yes, our, our lectures were traditional. Um, and so that is much harder in asynchronous and we understand that. These kind of experiments are much harder in, in an asynchronous class because you can't do that quick feedback with students, right? You're not always with them to see that it's not going well. If you have the opportunity to experiment first in a face-to-face, -face, I highly recommend it and then integrate it into an online class. Um, that's probably gonna be a much smoother plan if you are uh, at the point in your career where you do not have that option, whether your part-time faculty or your college is still uh, fully remote, then I would suggest picking one section and really focusing on just building it into that section and using differentiated instruction. So there are books on there out, out there in the world on what is called differentiated instruction, and you can read through exactly how to do it, but essentially it's changing the way that you assess students in an online class. So rather than trying to do a lot of written work, um, which is difficult for mathematics in an online class, you emphasize more on products. So students will have to grade exams. You didn't make your own core exam, and students are required to grade it and give the student feedback and explain to the student what was wrong and how they can address it. And that lets the student make sure that they learned, right? And it lets you make sure that the student can actually assess something. Um, they can come up with other products that are more artistically based and you can give students options so that they can play to their own strengths. And um, moving forward, I'm gonna allow students to make their own lesson plans. So if they wanted to explain that they understood something but had a hard time doing it the way I was asking them to, they could instead create their own lecture on it. Um, how would you teach this material? And for some students, it's much more comfortable. Um, for some of my students that had a hard time explaining things linearly, um, I encouraged them to pretend it was a video game because they could relate to that and that it was a tutorial level of a video game. And so they drew characters and they had call outs on their, their questions to be able to explain what they were doing piece by piece because it was too hard for them to take what the textbook was telling them and, and put it at their level. But they understood that a video game has to tell you every step right, it has to tell you what A does and it has to tell you what B does and it has to tell you how to jump and kick at the same time. <laughs> and so your reader has to understand that too. And so they were able to integrate that with it. But there's ways to do it and let really students experience the material in whatever way is their strength rather than whatever way is a traditional assessment. You have a lot of questions in the chat. <laughs> I'm going to try to address them all. If we miss you, I'm sorry. It's because you're so fantastic, right? That's everyone just wants to hear you talk. So um, I there's one question about if you're doing this in an in-person class, what does your class structure look like? Um, I was able to implement this partially with a, um, so I have two different answers. For my calculus classes, I was able to do a flipped style classroom. Um, that was easier to implement all at once because I found um, other, uh, I borrowed someone else's material for that, that flipping process. So, so I was using other videos. Um, and so students uh, watched the, the, the traditional introduction lectures on their own. And that gave us time in class to, to chat about it more. Um, in my stats class, uh, my lectures were pretty much identical, nothing day-to-day -day different. But to support the, um, you can do this as you need, catch up on your own, finish later if needed. Um, I gave them the same resources I give my asynchronous classes. And so they have kind of the opportunity to learn everything on their own, on their um, online system. And that if they didn't get it in class, they can figure it out or if they need to come back later. And uh, I was kind of picky with the online system of um, they had to kind of go through in order. There was uh, kind of some scaffolding built in. Um, so one thing um, that I did before you could take an in-person mastery, you had a, a preliminary one online. Um, but there were all the resources like if they were taught asynchronously. And then thankfully I already had that material 
um, to, for them to do that first. Um, I, I wanted to address the questions on how to fit your content in and still have group work. Um, and this one is a difficult one for me in particular, because I, I am a rule follower. <laughs> So when I get my course outline of record and it has cover these things and I cover those things, not just you know the basic examples, but I'm gonna go all the way through and make sure students can do multiple iterations of it. Um, and luckily I had Josh to reel me in. I would say the most important thing to make sure that you can both cover content and help students learn that content in group work is to view your course outline of record with a lens of humility that we get really excited for what we're passionate about. And so we want to teach everything to the highest level possible. But is that really necessary or helpful for our students? So take your course outline of record, take the CID requirements, take the requirements for transferring and really look at, does this on here mean that I have to teach this to a very high level or is it enough for me to mention it and make sure students understand the concept and then move on and emphasize something else? Um, so when we're going through our content and we're trying to squeeze it all in, do we really have to squeeze all that in or could we not be uh, a little more open to the idea that maybe students don't really need all of that at the same level to be successful in the next course? And if I can add to that, two things. One, if this is a sequential course, a lot of math classes are, talk to the person who teaches the class after. So if this is Calc 1, talk to the person who teaches Calc 2 and say, what are my students missing when they get to your classroom? And make sure you're focusing on those things. And two, um, that is where some of the question of teaching to different learning abilities and preparation comes into play. Because if you have some of those students who are more prepared than others and they get to the class and it's like, oh, you know, maybe they're not as challenged, give them some of those more in-depth questions. Give them the opportunity to explore some of the like the trickier ones or the ones where I know math were famous for like pulling out a rule you learned five years ago and going, ha, I bet you you forgot about that. And yes, of course they forgot about it, right? And and use those as some of like the challenge questions for some of your more high performing students. But like Brandy said, the focus doesn't have to be at that level for every single student. That was really hard for me to unlearn, really hard um, because I wanted to be, you know, I wanted all my students to have all the tricks and to know every little possible different scenario. And I had to just stop myself and go, you're, you're being too extra, pull it back because they don't <laughs> all need it. Um, it's really hard, right? I know, Danny, I get it. It's hard. Um, yeah. So um, I have a I have a private question in the chat. If an instructor uses chat GPT for student feedback, how is that not cheating if a student is cited for plagiarism for using chat GPT in a paper? I mean, I don't know if I have a perfect answer for that. And Brandy and Josh, feel free to chime in. I um, I think context matters. Um, I use it a lot in the way that Brandy mentioned. Uh, you know, it, it helps me remember to be a person sometimes when I respond to people because that is also not my default. This is why Brandy and I get along. Sometimes we're the same person. Um, you know, sometimes I forget to say things like, oh no, that's horrible. How are you doing? And I jump straight to, yeah, you can have the extra time or yeah, you can have, you know, the extension. And um, I think some of that context goes a long ways. Um, I don't know. It, it's hard though. And I think that's something we as instructors are also learning how to navigate and we're learning what those boundaries are. Um, it's hard. I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in on, on that. Um, yeah, I would I would reflect, I guess, on how ChatGPT is being used by students and why it counts as plagiarism in the way that it's being used. Obviously, if they just type in a, a prompt and get a paper, then you're dealing with something different. But if they're trying to get feedback on what they're doing, just as we were describing for the instructors. Um, then I think it's being used appropriately and wouldn't understand why it was being uh, claimed as plagiarism. I but see your hand up. I also see Eric's, but, but I will also throw out there, that's a really good conversation to have with your colleagues. Have that conversation with your department, have that conversation with your academic senates, with your uh, you know, division, whatever those subgroups look like, talk about it, because I think the more everyone can be on the same page, the, the more defined that can be, whereas if everyone is viewing this completely differently, then the expectations are all over the place, and that's also harmful to students. Um, Yarek. Well, uh, let's see here. From, from my perspective, as long as AI is perceived as a tool, 
um, no matter how elaborate, we all need to take responsibility for the usage and the outcome it generates. So in other words, you can't just take um, AI response at face value, copy and paste it and say it's yours. You do need to go through it. You need to edit it. You need to make sure that, that, that again, it addresses the, the, the questions that are, that are being asked. And I think that calling the, the uh, generation, uh, generation of text or generation, generation of, 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 of answers plagiarism is, is, is a bit of a stretch. It's, it's you know, if, if I am using a calculator and I, and I have a, let's just say a formula, and a calculator gives me an answer and I give it to the teacher, then would that be plagiarism because I used the calculator or, or you know, where I'm getting at this, that it's, it's, it's uh, chat GPT is certainly um, a very elaborate tool. I, I, I can certainly uh, attest to that. It's just that it's still a tool. And, and I'm sure that there is, you know, other, other scientific instruments that, that are, um, uh, specialists or or or, or uh, people who are really in the field of you know astronomy, geography, STEM, biology, and 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 medicine and whatnot, and they are always on the cutting edge, or they are trying to be on the cutting edge of, the, of this discovery, right? So once the um, answer is generated by by those tools, again, what matters is what this answer is, and it's up to the um, to the expert in the field to determine whether this 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 answer is is a good one or not in the context of where it's where, where the answer is occurring throwing it back at students and telling them this is plagiarism is is really kind of like you know shutting down the, the creativity aspect of it so that would just be my, my comment on it such great questions and conversation I love it who thought who would have thought all this uh math would bring about it <laughs> all this good chat. Okay, let me um, let me bring some of our slides back up. I can share some of what I'm doing in my classroom. Um, so I have a, uh, right now I have a hybrid class. Um, so we meet once a week on Tuesday nights. Um, it, it is late at night, <laughs> for better or worse, or worse, sometimes students are wide awake, other times they're just they're there <laughs> and, and we give them credit for showing up that day, I guess. Um, so one thing that I really started doing, and I started this in a fully online class, I think there was a year or two past COVID where I taught fully online and I, I it was weird not seeing students and I needed that to be different, but um, I emphasize math, what I call math teams. So um, I let them self-select. I find in online classes, they don't really know each other anyway, so they don't care who's in their team. Um, but in person or in hybrid, at least, um, they they just tend to flock to whoever's near them. Um, I try to give them some group stuff on the first day so that they um, kind of sort of know who each other are. But um, so I give them these math team assignments. Um, in an online class, I, I don't feel like I've perfected this in any way, but I give them uh, really one per SLO. And that's how I kind of operate with it. So within an online class, um, you, you know, maybe four SLOs, uh, they'll get one, one for each. And as a group, there's a worksheet that they complete. They can split it up however they want. I leave it up to them, but there is a reflection piece at the end of it of, um, do you feel like you did your part and contributed? Do you feel like your teammates did their part and contributed? Um, and I really just want them to um, talk. That's why I always tell them like, you know, somebody else is turning in work with your name on it. You should maybe talk to them about it first and you should have an idea of what they wrote down. Um, and then they self-select and they, um, they actually do two videos. So I break the questions into two groups, something, you know, a little more introductory and some of, you know, some of the harder stuff that I need them to know. Um, and they have to make, they can pick any question in that group and they have to make a video of how to solve it. Um, I tell them, you know, it, it can look like the videos I make for them, which are mostly like writing on a tablet or writing, you know, they see the screen and me writing it. Um, it does, it is nice when I can see their faces, especially online, because I don't always know who they are. Um, but I just ask them to do that. And I, I say, you know, I know photo math is out there, but that is, not really what I want to see. Like, I want to see something from your brains. You can use it as a jumping off point, but I want it to come from your collective um, sense. And everyone should have a say in this. Um, and I grade it on kind of a, a rubric uh, setup, which I can 
show in a moment at some point. Oh, so here's just a sample. Um, this is from a trig class that I teach. Um, and then this, this particular worksheet is for our hybrid class. Um, and I, I would like them to present a question within each other. Um, this has not gone as well as I wanted it to um, because they just don't want to present it to each other. But I try to get them like, you know, okay, at least show them on a piece of paper. If we're not going to do it in front of the whole class on the board, at least within your group, I want to see you explain it. Because um, for me, um, you know, the opposite of this very rigid, very, um, you know, like, where, where there's, I'm constantly looking over their shoulder. The opposite of that, where I feel like I started is um, giving them room to, well, how did you do that? Explain it to me, uh, work it out for me. How do you know that's true? Answer this, you know, and, and not in like an interrogation kind of way, but, um, you know, my, one of my favorite things to do is they'll write something down and I go, yeah, but how do you know? And I just kind of walk away slowly with a smirk on my face. <laughs> <laughs> um, and have them write it out. And they absolutely, you know, I have had students um, not know where to start on something like this. That's where I really like the idea of teamwork is they can ask somebody else. Usually somebody from the group understands it. Um, but if they have no idea at all, they can, you know, okay, look it up in the notes, look it up in, you know, where, where have we seen this before? And I try to get them to, you know, kind of use that research idea. It's not hard research, but, you know, um, well, where did you get it? How do you know? Uh, kind of kind of approach. Um, and so this is the rubric that I use. I know it's kind of hard to see. And this is one that I have partially filled out. I got rid of student names on it. But um, I have a scale of zero to four. Um, so zero is you didn't turn anything in. Um, one of the first things I learned is because I used to have one to four. And then I learned you need a zero if nothing got turned in. Um, one point for no submission makes no sense. So <laughs> First thing I learned, um, but I have this range of you didn't turn it in to nailed it. And I always in my head, that is Nicole's Byer, Nicole Byer's voice of nailed it. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that, um, but, you know, kind of like to Josh's point earlier, if they if they nailed it, it doesn't actually have to be perfect for me. There's a couple of small things maybe you have to fix, like maybe you dropped a negative and it's not a huge impact on the question. Maybe it was just in the last line, you forgot to write it there, or maybe you didn't reduce it fully or, um, you know, just something that's minor enough. I know a big one I run into in trig is they forget the degree symbol. I'm like, oh, that really should be there. I want to see that when we get to the midterm or when we get to the final, make sure it's there. But essentially you understood the point of this question. Um, so you're good. Um, and then it kind of skips scales down into, you know, you're mostly there. There's a handful of things that are missing. There's some things we need to fix and not there yet is mostly like, you know, you, you wrote a couple of things down and, and that's it. We don't really know where we stand on it. Um, and I try to give them really solid feedback. I, I really like uh, this work. This approach has really worked for me. Um, Yes, if, if you have the link, to, uh, Rosemary, if you have the link to the slides, it's it's in the bottom. I'd, I'd be happy to share it. Um, but it it's worked for me because it's given me kind of a chance to verbalize um, with more detail than just writing on their page, right? Um, oh, there was a negative here or, oh, you were supposed to do this here. It gives me the chance to kind of lay it out and also helps me make sure my comments are more consistent across my students. Um, I've had a few times where I can just copy and paste something because the, the feedback is the same um, and that's helped. And I, I think that, um, Oops, back one. Um, I think for me, this has been helpful because I, I don't know, I'm a very slow grader. I've always been a very slow grader. I want to really analyze everything and make sure it's the right thing. And this helps me categorize it a little better. And I think it also makes it a little less arbitrary, right? Like, oh, I didn't just take points away because I felt like, you know, dropping the negative in the last step was this life or death thing. You know, it's like, okay, it's a little thing get it right in the next one, but I'm okay with it for here. Um, and it also gives me a chance to link videos in. So I can see down here, I have a video of how to, um, you know, find, I think it's the coterminal angle, right? And here's a video on how I did that and they can click it right away and they can view it. So I attach this um, as a group and they can kind of see, and then they are allowed to resubmit. Um, if I'm being honest, they, they don't do it often. Um, a lot of times, I don't know if they forget, if they, whatever, but, um, they don't resubmit a whole bunch, but it gives them the chance to go, okay, you know, here's the little things that I need to fix, turn it back in. And most of the ones who do resubmit jump all the way to the final category and they get all those points back um, on their assignment. 
Um, I have it due on a weekly basis. Our hybrid class meets on Tuesdays, so I have assignments due on Wednesdays. So they have a little bit of time to fix stuff, um, but it's pretty flexible. That's my that's my strongly recommended due date, so you don't fall behind. I have three or four students who owe me a lot of worksheets, and we will get there, but. Um, I also am not super rigid on the teammates part. I've had a few people who did not like their teammates as much as they thought they would a couple weeks into the semester or later on. Um, and they can, you know, branch off, they can reform, you know, whatever. It, it, it's pretty flexible, especially at this part of the semester when everyone is tired and we know students don't always um, show up. But yeah, I agree with, uh, with you, Jacqueline. It is, it is hard to come up with a lot of this. Um, and I... I don't know. It's a trial and error thing. Um, I tried it. This is not the first, I think it's probably the third or fourth iteration of this because um, even I noticed some of my language, you know, in, in the top, I'm like, oh, okay, I could say, I could be nicer in how I say that, or I could be clearer in how I say that, or, um, you know, I try to make it very, you know, like there's some missing pieces. It's okay. Try it again. Or, you know, try to like think of how my wording is, um, but it is hard. It's very hard. Um, and to kind of circle back around to some other things that um, <laughs> some other things that other folks have brought up, um, my classroom is also most it's flipped. Um, so I have this hybrid structure. I have all these videos I worked really hard on during COVID and online era, and I, I wanted to make them still useful. I didn't want to just throw away all that work. So I do have a lot of things that are um, very flipped and Sometimes students come to class very prepared and have watched all the videos. And then there's other days where, again, they're tired and they just didn't get there. And it gives them time to um, talk to their classmates, uh, you know, work on things together. So um, I actually use pretty much the same rubric. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> um, oh, because it's newish. Um, but so I, I also use pretty much the same rubric for exams. Um, I have not fully moved away from exams yet. That is a really big um, issue, not issue, but that's something I really think about a lot because I would like to get away from them, but I also feel like I have to balance out who they're going to take after me. Because if most of the rest of my department is not doing something like this, and I, so I, I struggle with if I take away their exams, how does that, I have to make sure they feel ready for the next semester. And I don't know if that makes sense or not, but um, that's been a big challenge for me is I, I want to change a lot of things, but I don't always feel like I, uh, I feel like if I deviate too much from what's traditional, am I completely messing them up or am I giving them whiplash, right, as students? So we do it this way one semester and then we completely do it another way next semester. And that's been a, that's been a balance that I don't have the answer to yet. Um, and I'm still trying to figure out. Um, but like I said, I mostly use the same thing for their exams. Um, and then I do something similar. I actually think I mostly stole this from Brandy. Um, <laughs> their self-assessment. So at the end of their worksheet that they turn in together as a group, um, they individually will do this. And I, I renamed it a little bit, but, um, you know, they go question by question. Sometimes they answer all the, all the address, all the questions. Sometimes they don't. Um, I've had a few students answer this once or twice, like, you know, question one and question five, and that's all they want to talk about. Um, but just where are you? So did you feel like you understood it? Um, did you feel like you could mostly do it on your own? You can see some of the color coding is similar to what Brandy and Josh use. Um, and it's just this range of, um, and I tell them, I, you know, I don't, I don't care if they're all red, if they're all level ones for you. I just want to know, uh, I just want to know where you're at with it. And I want you to be honest. So even if your team, you know, nailed that question, if you don't feel like you're there yet, um, I want to help you and I want to support you. Um, and so letting them know, you know, like, you know, what was this question about? How do you rate it? why did you pick this rating? Um, Cause I want them to kind of see, it's not about like, well, I just don't like this topic. I'm like, okay, but that's a reason to give it a one. We can still not like it and that's okay. Um, and then asking them like, what can we, what can I do to help you out? Um, is this an in-class thing? And to my surprise, a lot of students say, 
nothing in this, what can we do in class to help you? They can say nothing. I need to practice more, or I need to go over my notes more. There's a lot of ownership that goes into this, um, which I love because then I don't, it's not more work for me. <laughs> this is very much a, you did it or you didn't do it kind of thing. You, you know, I just kind of put a check mark at the top and, you know, you received, and then they get the points on Canvas and, um, you know, nothing, nothing crazy on this one. Um, and then I also started doing, I, I've done iterations of this over the years, but uh, I think I'm most happy with this version. I do an exam wrapper. Um, it mostly applies to the midterm because, um, you know, the final is the end of the semester, but I, I always tell them, you know, when we sit down to take the midterm, I probably say it five times before I hand them the actual exam. I want to know what you know. I don't want it to be, um, you know, as much like I, I care that you learn. That's what I tell them. I really care that you learn something. And so the whole point is, well, how did you know, how did you prep? I want you to be reflective. Um, what are things you feel like you were really successful on? Um, and I can open up this whole one so you guys can see the whole thing. Um, but I want to know what you know. I want to know if you feel like you were well prepared for this or if you feel like you were not prepared at all. Um, that's good information for me to have. Um, and I can show the whole document. Um, you know, what do you think you did well? What would you do differently? And, and I want them to be really reflective of, you know, maybe they didn't study far enough in, a, in advance. Maybe they only studied one chapter and not another. It's really informative. I had one student tell me that they studied the wrong chapters and I was like, but it's a midterm. It's like the all we've, I, I, whatever, right? Um, you know, <laughs> there's the only thing we've covered. Um, being really honest about like, well, when did you start prepping? And students again are very honest. I get a lot of, I didn't prepare the day before and I go, okay, well, we need to talk about this um, because that matters. You know, if you're not really preparing for this, that, you know, it, it can affect the outcomes. I want them to think about how they studied. Um, and, and I get a lot of, I read my notes and then that prompts me to ask them, well, what do your notes look like? Or how, you know, how do you take your notes? And, you know, midterm is sometimes a hard place to ask those questions, but, um, you know, trying to get them to be really reflective of their own processes. And I also, um, I, uh, yes, I can share a link for it. Give me a minute. But um, I also want them to really think about where points disappeared for them. Um, because, you know, where, where did you lose points? Is it because I had no idea what I was doing? Is it a careless mistake? Um, is it I didn't know the formula going into it? I do give them a page of notes. Um, that for me is also cut down on cheating quite a bit, but just getting them to kind of process like, okay, if you're losing points, where is that happening? Is it consistently the same thing? Or is it, um, you know, completely different for every question. And and because again, it can kind of help support um, what they're missing. Um, and then writing out, so what are some questions that were most challenging for you? Even if you got them right, what was challenging about it and how you can understand it best for the final? I always ask what we can do in class to help because I think that that's really important for them. Um, you know, how can, how can we support you more? Because what I think might be working may not be the reality of what's working for them. And I want them to set a goal and talk, think about how they're going to reach their goal. Um, and then for the exam itself, um, I do give them the option of earning points back. Um, I do make them work for it because, um, you know, I, I want them again. I want, I tell them, I want to know that you learned something. So based on that rubric, if they, um, write out the correct solution and tell me why it is or isn't correct, or, you know, how, how you got there. Um, and then I want them to find a similar question. And this kind of goes to what we were talking about with Josh earlier. They could pick something much harder or, you know, maybe not much easier it has to be pretty comparable but um and and go through it again and you know try to try to show me that they understand the concept not just one particular question that I happen to pick so um again I didn't have a, hu a huge amount of people do this yet uh they might do it you know we have finals in two weeks I'm expecting to get a whole bunch of assignments next week but um we'll see how all of that goes um but yeah and this is something I refine a lot um, I've changed these questions quite a bit. I've changed the order of the questions quite a bit. I used to ask what you did well, third or fourth, and I moved it up to the top because I want them to start kind of on that positive note. Um, so yeah, and I think I'm missing stuff in the chat. So let me, let me stop sharing. Um, any questions out there that I missed, Brandy or Josh, that we should, or feel free to jump in at any point. 
It was um, mostly asking for the resource. There was a few um, points on how much harder this is online and trying to address that and not being able to give students back exams. So again, I the, one of the best solutions to that is really reassessing how we're doing exams online and whether or not there should be exams or products because um, that can help with that a lot. And then the uh, there was one question on how you keep things in your head. Um, I replied to that, but uh, you can also reply to that. I said I take notes because my head's already full and also sometimes very empty. Yes, uh, that's probably a better answer than what I could come up with. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that it's perfect all the time. I, I definitely feel like, you know, I, we all do this, right? As I go through the semester, I'm like, well, won't be doing that again next term. We will be changing that or we will be updating that or, um, and every class is so different. Um, but yeah, I, I understand, you know, not sharing your exams afterwards. I think there's ways to ask them to be reflective on a test. Um, maybe if they don't have that result yet. I know some people do exam wrappers before students get their results. Um, that's another way to do it where they don't, again, they don't know. Um, but yeah, I know them being posted online is a real issue. Um, and that's where, again, I try to really emphasize, I mean, I don't know if it sticks as well as I hope it does, but I really try to say like, it matters more to me that you learned than, than you being able to just write an answer down. Um, and that's what I really want. And I've, I've, I do ask some questions. I don't have any samples on me, but I do ask questions about explain to me how to do this or, um, you know, tell me it, for, uh, for trig identities, that's a really big one. How do you know you were able to, to solve, you know, verify this trig identity? What processes did you use? Um, what rules did you use? You don't have to know the name for it, but tell me what connects line one to line two to line three. And in words telling me what you did, um, because, you know, that that's their own words. It makes it a lot harder for them, um, but it's hard. And I, I do think the test piece is really hard. Um, that is something I would really love to step away from, but like I said earlier, my biggest struggle is I know for the most part, whoever they take after me is gonna be a very traditional teacher um, in the math sense. And I don't I don't wanna mess them up by, by going so far in one direction that they can't self-correct if that makes any sense. So um, yeah. So I, I see, I do see some questions. I think we answered most of them. We do have a couple more slides um, and things that we can share. I guess I didn't have to share. Um, that was Brandy's. So challenges and opportunities. I think we've definitely talked about this a lot. Um, I know for me, having this, these math teams together, um, I keep wanting them to rename themselves as a team and they all just look at me like, we're not, we're not renaming ourselves. Like, Give me some cool name and they won't do it. Um, but attrition, you know, students, they don't all persist through a semester and sometimes that does affect team membership. Um, so I do find sometimes towards the end, yeah, team awesome. Um, I have to move people around and, you know, it's it's not the worst thing because it gives them the opportunity to work with other people, but it, there is a bit of a, you know, some speed bumps we run into there. Um, I do definitely struggle with having students come to class prepared. Um, with the flipped format, with not being as rigid with this must be done by this time. I do have um, weekly due dates that are very flexible. Um, I use my open math for a lot of things and I just say when the due date passes, finish it in practice mode, let me know when you're done and I'll update your score. Um, you know, just, just so that they know that they have that opportunity. And, and I think Brandy touched on this earlier, students absolutely wait until the last minute. Um, I do get a whole bunch of things at the very end of the semester and it does stress me out. Um, I don't know a better way to do that. Um, but the, the, oh, and then technology, you know, like sometimes we think we submitted things or files don't open or, you know, those are challenges that we all run into. But I think one of the biggest questions that I grapple with is, how do I set them up to be successful next semester? Um, and I, like I said, I, I want to find a balance of what I really want to see with what they're going to see next term. Um, and, you know, I, we have a really big department. We have 17 full-timers um, and a whole bunch of adjuncts. I don't even know all of them. And it's hard to get everyone on the same page. Um, and so, you know, trying to kind of gauge you know, well, who's teaching this next term? What What's their teaching style like? How do I prep you to be really successful then? Um, but 
really big opportunities there the pressure is so like it is so minimized um i don't feel as much pressure to have to make everything perfect all the time um the way that i did before when i was live lecturing and you know, like the pre covid days the before times um being flexible with our students often means that they're a little more gracious to me when it's like, look, I didn't get any grading done this weekend. They're like, it's cool. We didn't turn anything in this weekend. So we're all on the same page, you know? So I find a lot more grace from the students. Um, I, I love the fact that they can fix any mistakes that they made. Um, that makes me happy because I can see it and it's like, oh, they do understand it. It's not just, you know, because in this one day, in this one moment, they didn't get it. Big picture, they, they do really get it. Um, and it. And it allows me to meet a lot of my students where they're at. So when they're doing this group work on our, you know, our hybrid in-person days, I can kind of gauge like, okay, they're struggling with this topic and I can sit and I can talk to them about it in the moment, as opposed to being worried about one lecture that has to meet everybody where they're at. I can sit and focus on one or two, or I know, okay, their teammate is really strong. They're going to help them out and they're going to help them to get there. Um, so for me, that's, again, it also alleviates a lot of pressure because it doesn't have to be me all the time doing all the things. I can share that around. Um, I think Josh is next, right? I think so. Um, you know, so some of uh, a similar theme. Um, I don't have it written in here, but um, one of the largest motivators was a student. This is about two years ago, maybe, and um, this was in a stats class specifically. The student had uh, a, a really good grade in the course. This was before any kind of my alternative structures. And I don't know, we were chatting about something. They were learning like a new topic that was very similar to an old topic. And I asked them a question. They're like, oh, I don't, I don't know at all what that is. And, and then they would like pull up a quiz. I think we were doing some work online that day in, in the classroom. And they were able to answer all the questions correctly, though. And so they had no context either. Um, and so part of like, part of what I've been really looking at a lot is the this for students to know what they know, to know what they don't know, or to know the, the context of the course, the so some little more than just the calculations and the concepts. Um, with the assessments, you know, one thing I was doing was the students actually graded themselves, um, you know, put some of the responsibility on them, engaging kind of like the exam wrapper also what went well, some ways to fix it in a sense. Um, that you know they if if it's just me giving it to them i'm worried that it doesn't get you know looked at it doesn't get reviewed um how much are they using that to to kind of further their learning um so uh i've been trying to kind of cultivate that it, it's all of us in the classroom it's me it's you it's the the class and it's all the different resources um and um, part of that is like the streamlining also. So, uh, you know, if a student is is passing is that traditional 70%, do they know 70% of all the topics? Do they know 70% of the topics perfectly and then, you know, not the rest? And then so that's why it's able to say, uh, we were talking about like, you know, there's comments about covering all the material, it's like, but certain parts of the material, especially with with math courses that are, um, you know, have ones after them or ones related to them are, are still more important. And if, if all the material is covered as equal importance, then students might not know that ahead of time. So highlighting that. So just being able to encourage students to, to, to think more carefully about their learning, to allow them and, and teach them how to focus on what's, what is a priority um, and to engage them more in, in that assessment process and, and give them some more responsibility and opportunity. And, and in some ways, just be able to reward a little bit more of the effort. Like I did put a lot of work into this. I was so close, but it was this one error. Um, sometimes the, I find that interesting in their um, different pieces, they grade themselves in different ways that they comment, um, oh, I, I really did almost know this. And uh, maybe I'm not gonna 100%, I'm not yet at the 100% letting them say, uh, I really did know everything here. <laughs> But every now and then they'll say like, oh, I really did know this pretty well. Um, 
that's been kind of my theme with this. And, you know, that has fit a lot surprisingly with that technology aspect that, um, you know, so much can be done now in the math field and, and now more frequently in all the other fields uh, done for us. And so students need to, you know, practice more about discussing it, uh, reflecting on it, um, getting to a, a calculation and answer has been, um, you know, while they still might have to do it on a closed, you know, in-person exam, as soon as we have something as difficult as asynchronous, then, you know, how do we know? And so that's all been kind of, of, of things I've been looking at. Randy, I don't remember if you had a slide, but do you want to add any challenges and opportunities? Um, yeah, I didn't make a slide. I opened the slide deck like seven minutes before we started. That's totally <laughs> okay. It's um, teamwork. See? Yeah. Brought it all together. <laughs> yes. Again, thank you both so much for all you put together for this presentation. You, you did so much work on this, and I appreciate it a lot. Um, and no, I don't have a slide, but I have very similar challenges to what Josh and Bethany were explaining. I would say the opportunities. Um, that I didn't figure out to pivot on until the end of class were really also related to that differentiating instruction. For my students that were doing really well, at the end of the class, I realized that I could stop overwhelming myself with work and ask them to help me with it because it allowed them to grow past where they were. Um, so there was someone who asked the structure of class. And in my class, we started every day with a game because we were playing, uh, we were we were playing, well, we were playing, but <laughs> we were trying to learn um, Calc 2 at eight o'clock in the morning. And it was really difficult for students to just jump into that. So every morning started with a game and then we would feel out that game for how long it lasted, depending on where the students were at. So sometimes they had questions on the homework and that game lasted two or three minutes. And sometimes they had just had a physics exam and they needed to work through some stress and that game lasted 20 minutes. Um, but that did mean that after class, I was responsible for getting out any information that might have been missing, which I did on a one off basis. If we didn't make it all the way through material, I would discuss with them what was upcoming and help them guide the lecture. Do you want me to show you examples or do you want to focus on work group work, letting them know what to expect um, to see for this content in the future? Right. So is this mostly a concept? So it's better if we talk about it as a group, or is this mostly you're going to have to be able to do this on a piece of paper. So it's better if you go to the boards and work on it. Um, but at the end of the semester, I realized that my students who understood it well could have been helping me create those solutions, right? And helping me create quick explanations. It would count as their homework credit and would also allow me to share it with the class with one of your peers has explained this concept really well. Um, here it is. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and we we wouldn't be a, a Friday SLO talk if we didn't talk about some of the outcomes we experienced, right? <laughs> um, I think Josh, you were up first on this one. Um, do you want to share? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think I mentioned earlier, part of of this whole movement for me has been making it clear for students what they learn. Um, you know, we. I've, I've always said, these are the most important topics. Here's what I need you to know. And they, I think they knew that on a quick memorized basis. Um, you know, what is the most important thing, blah, blah, blah. And they can repeat that to me. But I you know, tried to move that into the, 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 the structure of the course itself. Um, and so what was kind of interesting is, um, so, so we rewrote our uh, SLOs for the course. And then when I started this, I realized I actually don't like those SLOs. And so I rewrote them myself again. So in my syllabus, I have something very similar wording to SLOs and I call it like student friendly version. And then I have like an SLO official version um, because I realized it didn't quite reflect what I wanted to have students focus on. And so um, I actually kind of, from the top down, I, I tried to focus this on uh, what are the outcomes of this course? And here are here's the content related to this outcome. Here are the mastery items related to, to that outcome. And the, um, the, the, the quizzes for this mastery system reflect that. Um, so there are the, the two or three most important topics, have those built into there. Um, this is my, my first paragraph for the mastery grading system. Um, I, I, some of the questions about where uh, where we can find all the links. So most of them, hopefully we have them all 
in the slides, so the Google slides in the presenter notes at the bottom, there is a link anytime we had a reference. Um, and so uh, I, I just really wanted students to, to more clearly know what they've been learning. And um, like, of course, along the way, more uh, kind of deeper level of that learning, it, it hopefully, but also just later when they leave this course, hopefully all these structures in place have put that put that there. Um, so yeah, big focus for me was was really making it kind of outcomes based to start with. And it, it fits perfectly with this group and what this group is about. But yeah, I, I I think that's such a good way to frame it is making sure students know exactly what we want them to know. Um, I think for math, especially that is really important because it feels very like mystical and secret, not secret, but just very like, I don't know, students are very intimidated by our classes, right? On, on day one, I, uh, I have a colleague in sociology who always teases me about like, what is it like for students to hate you from the first moment they walk in your class? You know, <laughs> I know they just, they don't even give us the benefit of the doubt. It's like, I hate you. I hate everything you do. I don't want to be in this class. You know, It's, it's hard. And, and I think having things be so straightforward, it, it really goes a long way. Um, I know for me, the outcomes, like having students be able to explain things so much better than I've seen before. Um, and that confidence piece is so important. And I, I don't know, for me, having having students who don't feel the constant pressure of like this week to week, it must be done a certain way on a certain timeline. I, I see more ownership of it. Um, I had one student uh, a couple of weeks ago tell me like, I know I'm behind, but I feel like I'm really understanding some of this. And it's the second or third time they've taken trig. Like, I really feel like I'm understanding it for the first time. I'm like, oh, okay, let me help you get to the finish line. But like, it just makes me, it makes me so much happier when I hear something like that. The other thing that I see is more of my students are going to tutoring. Um, I don't know how long they're staying, <laughs> but they are more um, there. I'm seeing more of them actually visit our STEM and Mesa Center um, and get help from tutors because they can articulate their questions a little bit better than um, some of what I've seen previously. Um, for me, some of my personal outcomes, um, the prep is very different for a flipped classroom. Um, I actually, in some ways, treat it kind of online where I have, um, you know, a lot of things almost like you would in an online class, right, because it has to all be done um, ahead of time. And so the prep is just different. And so there is some weirdness. Uh, you can see my little note at the top in this unlearning of how we've always done math. Um, Josh and I were kind of talking about this earlier this week and we were prepping for this because, um, you know, we the way we learned math is the way that our professors learn math and the way that their professors learn math. And there hasn't been a lot of change over the years. But, you know, it it, it takes a lot of energy, I think, to really stop. And, you know, um, we, Josh and I were even talking about, um, you know, how arbitrary some of our, our textbook sections and chapters are put together, right? Like, just because the book I use puts this in 1.1 and the next one in 1.2 and 1.3, I don't have to call it that. And I don't have to break it evenly at 1.1 and then 1.2. I could do 1.1 and a half and merge them however I want or split them however I want. And that that is very freeing um, because I think so often we're tied to textbooks and publisher materials. And when we have a lot more of that ownership or we have that freedom and flexibility even, to um, you know, treat the class like a true learning experience rather than things I have to get through and things I have to do, um, but it's hard <laughs> and it takes a lot of very conscious, like it's okay if I do this differently, it's okay if I'm if this is not what I've always done. Um, and and it is, it, it, regrading does take a lot of time. You know, some of my other points here, regrading does take a lot of time, especially when things are at the last minute. I don't have a good system for that yet, but. I'm trying to filter it better. I'm trying to send more reminders early on of, you know, hey, don't forget, you know, don't wait till the last minute. Please turn this in now. Um, and also, you know, deciding kind of what are those topics that I want to lift up to the top of like, what are the most important things that they need to get through this in this semester? Um, that can be challenging too, because 
you know, I think we all love what we teach and we all love our disciplines and we're so, you know, it's like, I can't cut that one. That's one of my other favorites, you know, or I really like this one or, you know, and we might love them for different reasons uh, than, you know, what they actually need to get to the next class. It's like, oh, it's like choosing your favorite things are hard, but, you know, there is value in it. And it doesn't mean that students never, ever see it. There's ways to kind of bring it in. It just doesn't have to be with such intensity all the time. Um, and Brandy had to jump out. Um, one of her kids needed her. So uh, we'll, we'll kind of round it off. But I did put contact info for all of us. Um, please feel free to reach out and ask questions. And um, I'll stop sharing. And I, I don't know if there's more room for other questions. Um, I see Danny sharing about her stats class. Um, you know, we're, we're going to try to do it differently and be uncomfortable. Yeah, it's, it's a good struggle. I love that. I'm going to definitely steal that from you. Um, yeah. Yeah. And Rosemary, to your point, I have lost students for that reason. I had a student get really mad at me and say, you're not teaching me. Um, this isn't learning. And they dropped the class. And it's like, I, I just, I, I, you know, this isn't for everyone. I get it. Um, it's, it's different. Um, but that, that has happened. And I also would wager, uh, there are other factors at play. Uh, I know, um, as a, as a female STEM instructor, I am under different scrutiny than I think some of my male colleagues are as a, um, a woman of color, not always perceived that way. There's lots of overlapping intersectional things that happen there as well. That can be hard. Um, but yeah, it's not, and it's not for every student either. So I think that's, that's okay. We have to be okay with that. Any other questions or thoughts or things we want to throw out there? If not, I'll throw it back to Yarek. All right. Fantastic. You're absolutely right. Fantastic discussions. Let me go ahead and uh, uh, stop the recording and then we can we can just just hang out and ask, ask more questions if we have any.